let's uh, begin with a word of prayer, and we will uh, dive in. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us, for your salvation, for the joy of Christ, for the privilege of serving you. And I pray, Lord, as we look through your word today, that you will challenge us, you will transform our hearts, and that we will truly live that supernatural life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like, you can follow along using the inserts uh, in the bulletin, or the ushers do have extras. Just raise your hand and they will get that to you. I want to talk, I want to start by saying there's a word that makes the sublime common, the holy secular and the beautiful normal. It is a word that strips away uniqueness and decapitates imagination. It is a word that reduces your highest dreams to unreachable fantasies. It belittles your highest hope and your, and your loftiest dreams. It is a word that laughs at your thoughts and denies your ability to think beyond. It is a simple word. A word used by everyone almost every day. It's a word that you wouldn't think twice about. It's a four-letter word. A word that is common, hidden, ordinary, yet it can be so demeaning. It is the word just. In the movie Finding Neverland, which came out in 2004, it begins with the man who would eventually create the story of Peter Pan. And he's in the park working. He's thinking. He's imagining. And he's believing. As he's there, he begins a conversation with the boy, then his brothers, and finally his mother. They all gather to hear this story. He grabs his dog as this one parent family watches, and he says, I'm dancing with a bear. And one of the boy yells out, it's just a dog. You know, as we view scripture, we see how others may have been viewed or even vilified. Moses is just an old man who can't even talk well. Ruth is just a foreigner. David is just a shepherd. Mary is just a kid. Jesus is just a man. The Bible is just a book. We are just a church. You are just a person. You can see how one simple word can deny any kind of uniqueness and strip you of any kind of imagination. But I'm here to tell you that we are not just a church and you're not just a person. And in Christ, we are so much more. In Christ, we find our greatest humanity, our greatest potential, our greatest functionality. In Christ, we become. In Christ, we live life abundantly. In Christ, we are made in new creations. In Christ, we dive into mystery. In Christ, we are challenged. In Christ, we are not comfortable. In Romans 8.17, we read, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Our faith is active and dynamic. It is alive and moving. It is supernatural, given to us by God. Our faith connects us to Christ, makes us look like Christ, carries us to God, transforming us. Our faith is Christ. In Christ, we're made God's children. And as God's children, you are made equal to Christ, as it says in Romans 8, 17, co-heirs with Christ. To me, this is overwhelming. Can you imagine co-heirs with Christ? And as God's children, we, are, we get to enjoy that relationship. It is incomprehensible and inconceivable and inexplicable to be called co-heirs of Christ. What is man that God is thoughtful and mindful and compassionate of him? Who are we that God would go to such great lengths to make us look like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? I would dare say that if God who gave us so much and continues to give without measure, we are not just people. Yet our walk with Christ is something that will not just happen but something in which we are called to develop. We will, have, we will have to pay the freight, if you will. We will have to count the cost. In Romans eight seventeen again, it says, if indeed we share in his sufferings. As we walk in Christ and walk in faith with Christ, our closeness with him will not come without struggle. It will not come without suffering, without some kind of cost. Yet as we endure the struggle, it is within that we become more and more transformed. At Crown College many years ago, we had this college professor named Al Prentice. He was one of the business professors. 
And he was, he was a great man. I believe if you ever felt discouraged or low, you would go see Al Prentice and he'd cheer you up. And I remember one time going to, walking by his office and there was, he had this saying on, the side, on his door and it said something like this. No mariner, beca- or mariner or whatever that is, became skilled in calm seas. That's my paraphrase. Well, no Christian becomes Christ-like without struggle, without suffering, and without difficulties. Romans 5.3 says, Paul wrote this, We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. He would later write this difficult verse in 1 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12, I mean. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. Whoever, whoever delights in insults and weaknesses? And this is what Paul wrote. I delight, because when I'm weak, says Paul, Christ is strong. Our relationship with Christ is precious and wonderful. It came at a great cost. It requires we count the cost. It's a relationship that demands imagination, wonder, and awe. And it means we live in faith, challenging the world and offering Christ. I challenge you today, live by faith, not by sight. Go to the challenges, run toward them, the difficult, ready in yourself in the face, in the face, uh, in the face of the situation. We're in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter one or three. The Jew Gentile problem is evident and Paul is writing to settle the problem that the Judaizers have come in and caused the problems. The main problem has to do with the law and the Gentiles. How does a Gentile who's not a Jew become righteous? And how does a Gentile make himself available for Christ? And the Judaizers who came in says, in order to be saved, you first have to be a Jewish person. You have to follow the Jewish laws. You have to be circumcised. You have to be, uh, you have to obey the food laws. You have to obey the Sabbath. You have to be, you have to do the things that are Jewish, that were commanded by God in the Old Testament. Then you'll be able to have faith in Christ. But the most important issue to the Judaizers was the issue of circumcision to identify that those who were in the covenant were identified as prescribed by God to Abraham in Genesis 17. Paul said, as he countered the Judaizers, he said, faith in Christ, faith will lead you to Christ. He will lead you to God. There was no need to make yourself righteous before coming to Christ. (laughs) Then why would you need Christ? Another thing that Paul is contending is that the gospel that he's preaching, that he's continued to preach, is not something he made up. It's not something new. In fact, what he's teaching has been revealed to him by Christ, and it's something that is revealed in mystery in the Hebrew Scriptures. The gospel to the Gentiles is not anything new, but a reality of God's heart and a desire that is finally coming to fruition in the the present time. Christ is not for a people, but for all people. Christ is not to be kept, but but given, but revealed. Christ isn't to be held back, but, but given away. All are able to come and all are able to know. In Revelation 7, 9, we read this. After I looked and before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. All of humanity, everyone is welcome to come to Christ. He did not come for a few, but for all. He's not distinctly ours, but we are called to be distinctly his so that others may be distinctly his. Should we not welcome others to know the greatest name? In John three seventeen, we read, For God did not send his son to, into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. To save the world. When you walk with God, he transcends our human or thought or desires. He takes us to places where we are uncomfortable, but exciting, dangerous, but amazing. He shows us himself and offers to reveal himself through us and through you. He calls you, he equips you, and he overwhelms you to live in our own sinful imaginations. We will miss out on the wonder he has called us to know. I tell you, live by faith, not by sight. So the first thing we want to look at here. Is wisdom is expressed through faith. Well, let's come to uh, Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 1 and read through 14. So wisdom is expressed through faith. 
You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing if it really was for nothing? Does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand, then, that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel and advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that we that the blessed given the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive the promise of the spirit. So wisdom is expressed through faith. Timothy Keller wrote a book called The Reason for God. Highly recommend it. And in it, he talks about the work of Richard Dawkins. Of course, Richard Dawkins is that famous atheist who wrote the book called The God Delusion, where he ridicules, of course, Christianity and the belief in God. And Richard Dawkins and and Timothy Keller is uh, quoting sort of the work that he does. He says this, you cannot be an intelligent person or an intelligent scientific thinker and still hold religious beliefs. Sounds like a pretty dogmatic statement. It is one or the other, he says. To support his thesis, he points out that a study in 1998 showed that only 7% of American scientists and the National Academy of Sciences believe in personal God. This is proof that the more intelligent, rational, and scientifically minded you are, the less you are, uh, less you will be able to believe in God. Now, interesting, in August of 2013, Rob Waugh wrote an article for Yahoo News entitled, Religious People Are Less Intelligent Than Atheists, Study Finds. And the article says this, Religious people are less intelligent than non-believers, according to a new review of 63 scientific studies stretching back over decades. A team led by this man, Miriam Zuckerman, of the University of Rochester, found a reliable negative relation between intelligence and and religiosity in 53 out of 63 studies, even in extreme old age, intelligent people are less likely to believe. What does this say about our scientists and people we call intelligent? You know, I, I'm, I think I'm with Paul. I'm a fool for Christ. In First Peter 1, Paul wrote this statement. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Where are they? Where is the scholar? Where is the intelligent person? They have rejected and run from God. If the starting point is to doubt God and to remove God and to not expect God when intelligence is determined, then are we not creating for ourselves a false perception and an illusion of hope? Are we not removing the basis for our existence? Although there may be intelligence, there is no wisdom. Although there may be men and women who are capable, there is no direction. Although, they're, they're, you know, we live in a fool's paradise and pat ourselves on our backs thinking we have solved the problems that have plagued man only to have created a thousand more. Wisdom does not come from the intelligence we think intelligent means, but from a relationship with God. Wisdom acknowledges, submits, and is humble. There is no humility in our understanding of intelligence. And let me tell you, when there is no humility, there is no wisdom. In Galatians 3, Paul asked the Galatian church six questions. The first one is, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? 
Paul used the word fool to indict the church for it began to think naturally, not supernaturally. They began, they became foolish when they were shown wisdom. They began to view the world in their own limited vision instead of God's vision. They begin to lose wonder and mystery and accept anything that seems palatable and easy. They lost sight of the treasure and the beauty and thought human endeavors trumped anything godly or spirit filled. So let's make a few observations in this first part of chapter three. Number one, faith in God counters the natural. Faith in God counters the natural. You know, as we read about Galatians, Paul was upset because he had clearly described and shown and revealed Christ crucified to this, these people. Christ had to die. All of their brilliance or all of their abilities or all of their talents could not equal the power and the truth and the wisdom of Christ dying. Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified, he says. What does Christ crucified tell us? It tells us who we truly are. It tells us we are sinners, that we're incapable, we are brutal, we are evil, we are capable of so much pain. Christ crucified is not a pretty picture. It is not flattering. It is not to our good. Our creator who walked on the earth was crucified. What does this tell us about ourselves? How smart are we truly when God walks among us and our response to him is death? Are we truly wise and intellectual? The message of Christ is the message of who we are, and it's the message of who God is. God is holy. God is worthy to be worshipped. He is worthy in that he deserves to be acknowledged. He deserves to be addressed, bowed down to, submitted to, and sought after. He is worthy for us to say, to declare, and to proclaim, God, you are holy. That is what is happening on the cross. Christ is acknowledging the holiness of sin and acknowledging and understanding and knowing the wickedness of man. In all our efforts, in all our brilliance, can we acknowledge God's holiness? We will never, no matter how smart we think we are or how capable we believe we can be, we will never acknowledge God's holiness. And Paul told the Galatians, you were given a clear picture of who God is and who you are. Do you really think that God is any weaker and you are any stronger? To seek and acknowledge God through faith challenges the natural order of this evil age. We live in faith counter of what the world declares. We say God created. The world screams, you are here by mistake. We say there is a God in Christ who loves you and made you for himself. The world cries out, you're alone. We say God made you in his image. The world states, you're made from nothing. We say you're a sinner. The world demands that every behavior should be accepted and not judged. We say Jesus died for you and rose again to save you. The world rejects our need for salvation. We say miracles happen. The world scoffs. The message of the gospel is spelled out in the truth that Jesus Christ was and is clearly portrayed as crucified. We cannot go any further until we go to the cross. The reality of who we are is revealed in the cross. Live by faith, not by sight. Uh, number two, gaze upon the cross. Paul said, so we are to gaze upon the cross. Paul wrote, who bewitched you? In this first verse, who led you astray? Who gave you the evil eye? Look at this question that he asks after this. Did you receive the spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? How did you experience? How did their experience in the Christian faith begin? It began with faith and it has to continue in faith. What are we what we are incapable of making happen in the first place? We are not capable of fulfilling. The Galatian church was exposed for who they were by Christ and exposed their weaknesses. Now they feel they're strong, capable, and able on their own. You see what is happening? They received the Holy Spirit when they humbled themselves before God, falling before him broken, weak, and defeated. When they fell before God, God lifted them up. God gave them his spirit. Now they're able. But what the Judaizers were doing, they were clouding the message, demanding they become better through human efforts. There is no submission. There is no humility. There is no brokenness 
when you think about yourself, when you try to work on yourself through human effort and make yourself available to God through human effort. You turn to yourself. Paul said, are you trying to attain your goal by human effort? If it took the hand of God, if it took a supernatural act to save you, to heal you, to redeem you, do you really think you can continue this life without the supernatural, without the hand of God and the work of God? Our faith is a supernatural statement, a supernatural journey, a supernatural proclamation. We are the miracle of God expressing itself to the world. How dare we try to turn it into a human act? A natural act. Our legalistic acts will not please God, but we think we'll be better people and all our attention will be on us. Our lives are an expression of what God has done when he touches us. We lose sight of ourselves when we focus on God. We lose sight of ourselves and we begin to seek ways to love others and give them Christ. I tell you, live by faith, not by sight. Number three, faith is acting like Abraham. As Paul continues, he wanted to point out that what he's been teaching has not come from something himself. He did not make this up. It came from God. The faith that Abraham, what was it that made Abraham righteous, he asks. What was it? It was faith in God. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What that means is that God put righteousness into his account. He put it into his account. What he was unable to do, God did. God made him righteous. God made him acceptable through faith. Therefore, the righteous live by faith. When we live by faith, we do not live by human effort. You need to be, you do not need to be biologically connected to be Abraham's offspring. You need to be spiritually connected. You do not need to be Jewish, but a person who has faith in Christ. But the beautiful picture we're seeing in this passage is that the Gentiles were in the plan of God all along. When when God told Abraham, when God said, all nations will be blessed through you. All nations, that is the promise. God has truly and desires to reach the world. And Timothy Keller, again, quoting from his book, talked about the spread of Christianity, says this, the pattern of Christian expression. That's where my missing N was. (laughs) The pattern of Christian expansion differs from that of every other world religion. The center and majority of Islam's population is still in the place of its origin, the Middle East. The original lands that have been the demographic centers of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism have remained so. By contrast, Christianity was the first dominated by Jews and centered in Jerusalem. Later, it was dominated by Hellenists and centered in the Mediterranean. Later, the faith was received by the barbarians of Northern Europe, and Christianity came to be dominated by Western Europe and then North and the, then Northern North Americans. Today, most Christians in the world live in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Christianity soon will be centered in the southern and eastern hemispheres. That is, all nations will be blessed through you. The message of Christ is for all people and it's becoming a reality more and more each day. Live by faith, not by sight. Second point, the life of faith overcomes. Let's take a look at, start with verse 52. Uh, excuse me, 315, 252. Start with verse 15. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through an angel by a mediator. A mediator, however, is not, a, not, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. 
But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The law requires human effort to fulfill. Faith is God's work in you. A missionary family serving Christ in a foreign country did not have access to peanut butter. And this particular family happened to enjoy peanut butter. Well, who doesn't like peanut butter, you know? Unless you don't like it sticking to the roof of your mouth. Well, this missionary family rather creatively made arrangements with some of their friends in the States to send them peanut butter every now and then so they could enjoy it with their meals. The problem is they didn't know until they started receiving their supply of peanut butter that the other missionaries considered it a mark of spirituality that you not have peanut butter with your meals. I suppose the line went something like this. We believe since we cannot have peanut butter, we should give it up for the cause of Christ or some such nonsense. A basis of spirituality was burying the cross of living without peanut butter. Well, this young missionary family didn't buy into that line of thinking. In fact, rejected it. Their family kept getting peanut butter and regular shipments. They didn't flaunt it. They didn't say to the other missionaries, look, we got peanut butter. They didn't do that. But the pressure began to intensify. You would expect adult missionaries to be big enough to let others eat peanut butter if they needed to eat peanut butter. The legalism was so petty, the pressure so intense, and the exclusive treatment so unfair, it finished them off spiritually. This family had had enough. Unable to continue against the mounting pressure, they packed it in and were soon homeward bound. Disillusioned and probably a bit cynical. Well, you can replace peanut butter with a lot of different things. Just replace it. I don't do this. I don't drink that. I don't eat that. And the legalism fits. Live by faith, not by sight. Let's make a few observations. Number one, we cannot add to Christ. Christ is complete. Christ is the fulfillment of righteousness. What can we do? How can we help him out? How can we make Christ better? You can't improve on perfect. Okay. Earlier, Paul wrote, the righteous live by faith. The law is not based on faith. Christ became a curse for us. Christ endured the shame. Christ endured the hatred, the pain, the evil, and the wickedness of man. He died to make faith available for you and me. He died to remove the curse. He died to redeem us. He died so that we might receive the Holy Spirit. We cannot help or add to Christ. Number two, the promise is given, not earned. The promise is given, not earned. Paul said the law was introduced 430 years after Abraham. 430 years after Abraham lived. How did Abraham become righteous then if the law was introduced 430 years? (laughs) It's not fair to Abraham, right? Abraham was made righteous through faith. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. How was Abraham to know righteousness? He knew righteousness because he had faith. It was given through faith. The promise is a supernatural event that that God will provide. The law requires human effort. The Jewish nation lived knowing the promises of God were a reality since God kept his word. It's interesting that Paul separates law and promise. He separates. The promise of God is that he will bring people to himself. He will make it happen, but not through law, not through human effort, but through Christ. He did not leave it up to us so that we would find our way to God. We would never begin to look if he left it up to us. He would not leave that up to us to find our way to God. Rather, he said, I promise. His promise is found in his word. It's found in his character. A promise was something he gave to his people, the Jews. And he said he wanted them and needed them to hold on to it, to keep it, to carry it, to not forget. He wanted them to know that he would carry them through. He just wanted them to remember his promises. The promise has always been in his word. And it's the promise that we know in the quietness of our heart. A sense of hope where Christ chases the darkness away. In in, uh, John Bunyan, I believe his name, wrote the book uh, Pilgrim's Progress. 
And Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory of Christian walking through life. And that's the name of the character is Christian. And he talks about how Christian was walking along this pathway. And, and, and as he gets into this pathway, the ground grew soggy. It was covered with the poisonous vines. And the sky became black. And, the Christ, and Christian spent the night huddled at the foot of an oak tree. And it was caught in a downpour. And next morning, the character, giant despair, came upon him, captured him, beat him, and imprisoned him in the dungeon of doubting. Remember, this is an allegory story. And so he was thrown into this castle of dun- this dungeon of doubting called Doubting Castle with its grim battlements and thick black walls. And Christian tried to sing, but he couldn't. And finally, at length, he found in his dungeon, in his cell, a rope a knife, and a bottle, the tools of suicide. And for a moment, he was tempted to end his misery. And then, in the writings of Bunyan, he says this, A little before day, good Christian, as one half amazed, broke out into his passionate speech. What a fool am I, thus to lie in a stinking dungeon, when I may as well walk at liberty. I have a key in my bosom called promise. That will, I am sure, open any lock in Doubting Castle. When we are in despair, when we hold on to the promise, let me tell you, live by faith, not by sight. And finally, number three, faith in Christ leads us. Faith in Christ leads us. Let's look at the last few verses of this chapter. Before this faith came, we were held in prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. Verse 24. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ and that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Faith in Christ leads us. As God revealed himself, why did he give his people the law? The law is a standard of righteousness. It is a standard of righteousness, not a means to gain righteousness. It's like a mirror. Let's say I went out mudding, you know, on my a four-wheeler or motorbike, and I come back filled with mud, and I look in the mirror. What do I see? I see that I am a fil- I'm dirty. I need a shower, right? Don't agree to that. (laughs) I need a shower. Now, if I look at the mirror, can the mirror do anything about my dirtiness? Can the mirror do anything about taking away the dirt? It can do nothing. It has no power over the dirt in my life. It can only reveal it. That's what the law does. The law has no power over your unrighteousness. It can only expose it. I can't take the mirror and start rubbing my face on it. What good would that do? Neither can trying to obey the law make you righteous. It can only reveal to you how you look. It has no power in your life. Earlier, Paul wrote, What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of the transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred to has come. In Romans 7, Paul had written this, What then shall we say? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting was until the law said, Do not covet. In other words, the law does not produce righteousness. It brings sin to life in your life. It wasn't that the law is not righteous. It is righteous. It shows you that you're not righteous. So number one observation, the law brings sin to life. If I were to say to you, do not do that, whatever that is, you're going to do. Because whenever there's an authority statement from an authority figure who says, don't do that, you're going, oh, I'm going to do that. Just you wait. We're like that. God is the ultimate authority. And when he speaks, we seek the opposite. We as a people do not run to God, but from him. We run from life to death, from freedom to oppression, from love to hate, from selflessness to selfishness. That is why Paul wrote, the sinful mind is hostile to God. Hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so, nor does it do so, want to. 
When God speaks, humanity cringes. Humanity disobeys. You, you disobey. You run from his words. We're naturally inclined to hear God's word and say, I'm out of here. That's why God chased us. That's why God sent Christ to you. The law cannot bring you life because it reveals your sin. Number two, the law is your tutor. The law is our tutor. In 324, it says, so the law was put in charge. Literally, the word tu- is the word tutor. And when you think of a tutor, you personally think of someone who sits over you, helps you do your homework, teaches you. It's actually the English word pedagogy. The tutor or pedagogy in the New Testament time was, not, was more like a nanny uh, uh, that we would think of today. And a pedagogy would watch over the child, usually hired by a wealthy Greek family, and they were usually slaves. They would take the child to get them education, take care of the needs, provide discipline. The way the Greeks viewed children was not very well. (laughs) They said this about children. And of all wild creatures, the child is the most intractable. (laughs) Child is the worst of them all. That's why they need a pedagogy to keep an eye on them. (laughs) The pedagogy would give watch care over this massive energy that was chaotic, this child, and give order and understanding until they were ready to be a child. The law, in a sense, held the world as a prisoner and acted as a pedagogy until God was ready to show us Christ. In effect, the law leads us to Christ, not away from him. The law is to lead us to our ruin, to our sin, so we can grow up in Christ. Christ is revealed when we reveal, when when we realize how bankrupt I truly am. When I look at the law and say, I can't do this, I am bankrupt. God is saying, finally, you're bankrupt. Come to me. When that happens, we find life. You see, when you live in submission to Christ, you experience life. The law brings you to your knees. Christ lifts you up. Live in faith. Live by faith, not by sight. And number three, Christ is the great equalizer. What the law does is legalism is what legalism does today. We tend to seek out differences based on how we act and how we look and what we deny ourselves. Somehow I look better if I do certain things and if I don't do certain things. But in Christ through the law, we realize one very important truth. We're all sinners. We're all guilty. We are all not righteous. We need a savior. We need Christ. And, and in Christ, we are made complete. We are made righteous. That is why he says in 328, this wonderful phrase, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor, uh, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter about your ethnicity. It doesn't matter what gender you are. If you are in Christ, you are righteous. If you are in Christ, you are righteous. It doesn't matter if you're wealthy. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you look different than me or if you're a man, you're a woman, you're from a different country, you're from Africa, you're Asia. What makes it acceptable in God's sight is faith in Christ. If I am in Christ, I'm no better than you and I'm no worse than you. I am in Christ. I do not have to try to be better than other people. I seek to live my life in submission to Christ each day. That is living by faith. I've told this story before, but I think it fits. Kaim Potok was a novelist. One time he gave a lecture. In, in conclusion, I'd like to tell this story. He gave a lecture at John Hopkins University. Shriver's Hall. And in his lecture, he told how at an early age, he wanted to be a writer. But it, when he went to college, his mother took him aside and said, Chaim, I know you want to be a writer, but I have a better idea. Why don't you become a brain surgeon? You'll keep a lot of people from dying, and you'll make a lot of money. Chaim replied, no, Mama, I want to be a writer. He returned home from vacation. His mother got him off alone. Chaim, I know you want to be a writer, but listen to your mama. Be a brain surgeon. You'll keep a lot of people from dying. You'll make a lot of money. No, Mama, I want to be a writer. This conversation repeated itself every vacation break, every summer, every meeting. Kaim, I know you want to be a writer, but listen to your mama. Be a brain surgeon. You'll make a lot of money. You'll keep a lot of people from dying. No, Mama, I want to be a a writer. The exchanges accumulated. The pressure intensified. Finally, there was an explosion. Kaim, I know you want to be a writer, but listen to your mama. Be a brain surgeon. You'll keep a lot of people from dying, and you'll make a lot of money. 
This explosion detonated a counter explosion. Mama, I don't want to keep people from dying. I want to show them how to live. That's what Jesus does. He shows us how to live. He shows us how to live. Live by faith, not by sight. Let's pray. Father, I am so privileged to know you. And thank you so much for saving me and setting me free. And I pray that you will touch the lives of people here. Let us know the true gift that we have because of Christ. And that we will seek you and submit to you each day. And live in this, in this, as we live in this evil age, we will show Christ to those around us. Burden us for those who do not know you so that we can share Christ to them. In Jesus' name, amen.